Welcome to the Kanoi Church Podcast. We're glad that you're interested in connecting through this teaching time. If you'd like to connect further, feel free to reach out to us through our website, kanoichurch.org. For now, enjoy this teaching from Kanoi Church, where our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't want to make the assumption that everybody knows the call and response, he is risen, he is risen indeed. We did it a couple times already, but in case you're not familiar with it, it is something that uh, hopefully if you're paying close enough attention to the message, you'll hear it and be able to respond to it. But if I say he is risen, you guys say? He is risen indeed. Okay. In the years and the days leading up to the cross, the disciples and the Jewish people are missing so much of the warnings and the sharing that Jesus is doing about the sacrifice that's awaiting him. The disciples are, are living and reacting and learning. I mean, this is life for them, but they don't have a great grasp of the big picture. The religious leaders and the Pharisees are often the ones who get the really bad rap in the story of Jesus, um, but they also lived in a world where they're just living in the moment. They lived in a world where they were memorizing predictions and prophecies about a Messiah who's going to show up and change everything, a Messiah who would usher in a new kingdom. And they all thought that that new kingdom was going to look like a, a new Israel with a new king, throw the Romans out, there'd be a rebellion with swords and battles and certain victory. And that's what the Messiah would do when the Messiah came. But there was this no-name carpenter from Galilee who became a rabbi, and he shows up and starts teaching things that were against all that they had ever known, all the predictions that they had understood, and they can't see him as Messiah. Even though he does miracles, even though he teaches nonviolence, even though he's primarily concerned with love, they can't see him as anything except a problem because he doesn't look kingly, he doesn't have an army. He doesn't wield a sword. He isn't bringing a new kingdom that's going to take the place of the Romans and kick their oppressors out. And what that means is it makes this guy, this Galilean carpenter rabbi, a problem. Just before Jesus headed to Jerusalem for the final time, just before Palm Sunday, Jesus raised a man, his friend, named Lazarus from the dead. Scholars often say that this is the, the greatest miracle that Jesus had ever done. And, and what we can now kind of look back on, we can see sort of a preview of what Jesus was going to do on the cross. Because Jesus literally goes to the tomb of Lazarus and he shouts life into death. While he's on the cross, he very much shouts life into to death. But this, this miracle that he does, this greatest miracle, it, it's huge, it's huge. He's, no one's done this before. No one's done this sort of raising of the dead in front of so, I mean, there was a huge crowd of people. This wasn't a private event. There was mourners there all over the place, lots of people. No one's done this, and no one's done it in front of so many people before. It's this miracle of raising Lazarus that actually gets the Pharisees to finally conclude, you know what, we need to kill this rabbi, this Jesus, this so-called Messiah. And what's more, we also need to kill Lazarus. Because if Jesus is the problem, Lazarus is the proof. We need to kill both. Well, Jesus leaves Lazarus, and he comes to Jerusalem, and there the people are waving palm branches. They're shouting, Hosanna, praise God. And the Pharisees look at each other, and they say, all is lost. He has the people because that's what it looked like. That's what Palm Sunday looks like. But the truth is, he didn't have the people. Their belief was connected to the most recent controversial statement that he made. Their belief was connected to the most recent teaching, the most recent miracle. It was novel, it wasn't love, it was popularity, it was shallow. Jesus then will take his disciples and he will sit them down and he will even tell them why they must die or why he must die. And so I want to read you John chapter 12, verses 23 to 26 this morning and see what you think. He says, 
The time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. The truth is a kernel of wheat must be planted in the soil. Unless it dies, it'll be alone, a single seed, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who despise their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. All those who want to be my disciples must come and follow me because my servants must be where I am. And if they follow me, the Father will honor them. Now, when we read that, it seems pretty clear to us, right? He's talking about a kernel of wheat dying to produce more kernels of wheat. He's saying the kernel has to die. Obviously, Jesus is the kernel, right? But the disciples don't get it. See, we have hindsight. We can look back on it. We can see Jesus' words, and we know the story, so it looks obvious to us. For them, it's not so obvious. They're not making the connection. Jesus actually goes on to to be even more clear. He says this. He goes, "Um, my light will shine out for you just a little while longer. Walk in it while you can. That way you will not stumble when the darkness falls. My light will shine out for you just a little while longer longer. Again, these words don't feel secretive to us. They don't feel veiled to us. They seem obvious to us. Jesus doesn't have much time left. Whatever he does with these remaining hours must be important. So he gathers his disciples. He gathers the ones that are closest to him. He brings them to an upper room, and Jesus does something really strange. He wraps a towel around his waist He grabs a basin of water, he kneels before each of them, and he begins to wash their feet. One at a time, each disciple. Now understand what's happening with me here. The God of the universe, okay? The God who created all of this, the God who put beats in my heart and breath in my lungs, The God who made the green grass, who made the blue sky, who made the trees out there. The God who put the stars in the sky and the planets further than we can see. That same God has come in the form of man. We call that the incarnation. Jesus, God incarnate, gets on his knees. Who gets on their knees? Not a king, right? Certainly not the king of the universe. Kings don't behave like servants, but he does. He gets on his knees and he washes the feet of his creation. He washes the feet of the disciple who would betray him. Jesus doesn't see Judas Iscariot as unworthy of love. He doesn't see him as unworthy of service. He doesn't see him for his betrayal. He doesn't see him with anger or malice or contempt. He sees him as one to be served and one to be loved, despite what he would do. It ends up being Peter, actually, who stands up and says, "Uh, Master, do not wash my feet. Don't do it. And Jesus says, Peter, don't you understand that if if I don't wash your feet, you have no place with me? And Peter, Peter being Peter, he's like, well, then don't just wash my feet. Wash my my hands and my head as well. And Jesus looks at him and he just, I, I imagine he chuckles a little bit. And he's like, Peter, if you had a bath, I don't need to wash your feet. See, Peter doesn't quite understand yet. Peter's trying so hard. We see so many examples of disciples and Peter specifically trying so hard to get it. And he doesn't quite understand yet. And Jesus dismisses Judas. Judas, who will betray him later in a garden while Jesus is praying, he says, Judas, go and do what you need to do. And the disciples don't understand what that means. Then Jesus pulls his remaining disciples close together. And he tells them something of infinite importance, something that for the last three years I have said over and over and over and over again. He says, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, love one another. For your love for one another will show the world that you follow me. Jesus is saying, this whole thing, 
Everything that I have taught you, everything that I've shown you, the way that I just washed your feet, it's that sort of love, it's that sort of service that's gonna show the world that you follow me. So, love each other. Don't do it in obligation. Don't do it because the law says you must. Love in a way that's fresh. Make it new each day because your love is going to set you apart. Your love for each other is my signature on your life. This feels a lot like a, a goodbye. And so Peter, our buddy, he jumps up again. And he says, Lord, where are you going? Where are you going? And Jesus says, where I'm going, you can't go, but you'll follow me later. Peter says, but Jesus, I am ready to die for you. I'm ready to die for you. And Jesus says, Peter, die for me? Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Peter is claiming to love Jesus so much that he's willing to die for him. And Jesus is saying, Peter, you're not where you think you are. You're not quite there yet. How can you claim to love me so much you'll die for me when you're, you're about to deny me? And if you saw the Good Friday devotional that I put out this week, then you already heard this, but when Judas comes to the garden and kisses Jesus and the guards rush in to capture him, it's, it's Peter who pulls his sword. It's Peter who, who strikes out against the guards that are coming and actually cuts off the ear of one of them. Peter must have been a bad shot, not what I think, but regardless, he cuts off the guard's ear. See, Peter's not ready to die for Jesus, but he's willing to kill for him. Peter doesn't get it. He thinks he does. He's trying, but if we're honest, he's pursuing his own way, not Jesus' way. Peter's ready to kill for Jesus. He's not ready to die for Jesus, and that's not a small difference. Those two responses are miles apart because that's, it's obvious to us when Jesus doesn't egg Peter on or when Jesus doesn't pick up a sword or when Jesus doesn't run away in the distraction created by this little battle. Instead, Jesus reaches out and he touches his hand to the head of the soldier whose ear has just been cut off and he heals him. He tells Peter to put down the sword. In disarming Peter, he's disarmed all of us. See, look, we often claim to get it. It's like Peter. We claim to understand. God, I love you so much that I will sing on the worship team for you. I love you so much, I'll give you my first 10%. I love you so much, I'm gonna lift my hands when I sing. I love you so much that I'll teach here and I'll serve there and I'll do this and I'll, I'll do that. But like Peter, our actual response is miles from Jesus. Like Peter, we often don't get it. When you tear your brother or sister down, you don't get it. When you gossip about one another, you don't get it. When you post those angry words online, you don't get it. When you ignore the people who are hurting right in front of you, you don't get it. When you keep track of everything that everyone else has done, you don't get it. Because that's not love. Because the world will know that you follow Jesus by the way that you love. Peter claims that kind of love, but Jesus says, Peter, you're not there yet, but you will be. So Jesus is arrested. He's put on trial, an illegal sham of a trial. He's found guilty, he's beaten, he's mutilated, he's humiliated, and then the God of the universe, the God who put the breath in my lungs and the beats in my heart, the God who made the green grass and the green trees, who made the sky, who put the stars in the sky and the planets beyond what we can see, that God of the universe is hung on a cross. 
Nails are driven through his hands and his feet. A crown of thorns is placed on his head and driven into his scalp. He is ridiculed. He is mocked. He labors over every breath. And then in John 19.30, he says, it is finished. And he dies. But, He is risen. He is risen. risen Now, I can't tell you what to believe. It's not my job. I can tell you what I believe. I think most humans are too stubborn to be told what to believe. I know that because I am way too stubborn to be told what to believe. The best thing I can do is, is tell you what God has been showing me this Easter. The best I can do is tell you how I experienced the work of the cross this morning. To me, that cross means that God sees us. It means that the God of the universe that puts breath in my lungs and beats in my heart, that made the green grass and the green trees and the blue sky and put the stars in the sky and the planets beyond what we can see, that that God of the universe sees us, that he hears our cries, that he hears my heart. He sent his son to earth in the form of a man to enter into this life with us, into all of these systems that we have created. (laughs) The son of God is gonna enter into grief and, and drama and sadness and temptation and joy and family and loss and all of the things that you and I experienced every day and every week and every month and every year of our life. He enters into all of those systems where we experience that stuff. He enters into the sacrificial system and he hangs on a cross and he shouts, it is finished. And when Jesus dies, the ground shakes The sky grows dark, and there's this curtain in the temple that's supposed to separate where mankind can go from where God can be. And that curtain said you can't connect with God except through a priest. That was the only way. And that curtain, in the moment that Jesus dies, the moment that Jesus says it is finished, that curtain rips in two and falls away, and suddenly the space where man can interact with God, there is no different space. It is one space. There is no need for the priest to be your intercessor. You can now access God on your own. So what is finished? When Jesus cries out, when Jesus gives up his spirit, when he says it is finished, what is finished? All of the systems All of the sin and the brokenness and idolatry that demands your attention and steals your focus and leads us into death, every single one of us. The God of the universe, he made a way. He gave us an out. He broke the chains. He showed us a new way. He breathed into us new life. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the life. He is risen. risen So let's remember Lazarus for a moment. We can all imagine how hopeless it must have felt. We've all had loss. None of us get to go through this life without loss. We can imagine how hopeless it must have felt for Lazarus to be dead and in the tomb how his family stood there and mourned, how they invited their neighbors and their friends and their family to come and mourn the loss of this beloved brother. We remember what Jesus says to Martha, Lazarus' sister. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Martha, do you believe? I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe? See, there's all these moments where Jesus almost gives away the story when we look back on it, right? He tells us about the arrest and the betrayal. He tells us about Jerusalem and the cross. He told us that he was there to break the hold of sin and death upon all of us to bring life and life eternal. He told us. He told us. And to his credit, 
And to our amazement, Jesus does not stay dead. The tomb is empty. He is risen. In each of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's women who go to the tomb on the third day. They're always a step ahead of us, guys. They brought spices to anoint the body of Jesus. And when they go to the tomb, the tomb is empty. John 20 tells us that they leave the tomb, they run away, almost all of them, to tell the other disciples that the tomb is empty. And Mary sits outside the tomb. And she turns and she looks into the tomb. And where Jesus' body is supposed to be laying, there are two angels sitting there. And they ask her, why are you crying? She says, because they've taken my Lord away. And I don't know where they have put him. So Mary turns away from the angels. She turns around and she comes face to face with Jesus. Jesus, who she does not recognize. Jesus that she thinks is the gardener. And this this man, this, this gardener, says to her, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? And, and Mary says, she, she begs, just tell me where you put him. I'll go get him. Imagine the devastation she must feel to feel like the tomb has been robbed, that her savior, her Messiah, her rabbi, her teacher, her friend is not there. Just tell me where you put him. I will go get him. And he looks at her and he says, Mary. And with her name, she recognizes that it is Jesus. He is risen. In John 21, there were those who were fishermen that followed Jesus, and they've gone back to fishing because fishing is the family trade. This is what they did. This is what they knew. They left fishing to follow Jesus. Jesus has left them. They go back to fishing. The problem is they're pretty terrible fishermen. That or the lake doesn't have any fish in it. But regardless, they're struggling to catch fish. And every time we see them fish in the Bible, they're always struggling to catch fish. There's a voice from the shore that calls out, There's a figure on the shore, and he says, friends, have you caught any fish? No. Maybe you should try casting your net on the other side of the boat. What a silly thing to say. Any fisherman knows. It's the same water on both sides of the boat. That's silly. But for whatever reason, they comply. They say, okay, guys, net on the other side. They throw the net on the other side, and the fish almost jump into the boat. It's a miraculous catch. And there are some of them that pause and go, deja vu? I feel like this has happened before. Why does this feel so familiar? It's the disciple John who goes, oh, my goodness. It's our Lord. It's our Lord. It's Peter who who jumps over the side of the boat and swims to shore to give Jesus a hug. These fishermen remember suddenly the first time that Jesus has called them. They remember the miraculous catch of fish. They remember being told, you are no longer fishermen. You are fishers of men. And now they see who it is. He is risen. In Luke 24, there are two disciples who are walking a road to a village called Emmaus, and they're talking and recounting everything that's happened. They're telling each other what they saw. They're recounting the facts of the story. They're discussing all that transpired. They're deep in conversation when suddenly a man comes walking up to them and begins to walk with them. And the man, a little nosy, says, what are you guys talking about? And these two disciples can't believe that this man, this stranger, this Jesus, that they don't recognize yet, has no idea what has happened over the last few days. So they begin to tell him the story of Jesus. They tell him, oh, they tell him the miracles. They tell him about the teaching. They tell him about the unfair trial, the crucifixion. They tell him of the empty tomb and what the women have said that they've seen. And then the stranger, Jesus, scolds them for forgetting what the prophecies have said how they foretold the death of the Messiah and the glory of the Messiah. And so Jesus, who they don't know is Jesus, continues to walk with them on the road and he explains all that the scriptures have to say about himself. I'd give anything to be in that little group of people walking. 
still the disciples don't recognize them, so they finally get to Emmaus. By the way, seven mile journey, okay? Not a short journey that they got to walk with Jesus and hear Jesus explain all the scriptures and still don't recognize them. They finally get to Emmaus, they say, hey, you should come with us into the house and eat with us, and so they get to the table and this stranger stands before them, breaks the bread and gives thanks, and it's during this prayer that they recognize who he is, because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Why does Easter matter? Because the God who created all of this, who put the beats in my heart, the breath in my lungs, the green grass and the green trees, the blue sky, the stars in the sky, and the planets further than I can see them, because that God entered into this world, and he walked on this planet, he walked in our shoes, he walked in our systems, And he hung on a cross and he died the death of a criminal to break those systems, to break our chains, to give us life and to defeat death. And and where we're not perfect, where we've overpromised, where we've been disobedient, where we've betrayed him, we have a God who meets us where we're at so much of the time in the familiar (laughs) Right? He meets us where we're at. He descends to us as an example of love. And when he returns, even the disciples, the men and the women who walk with him, who talk with him, who knew him, who saw him every day, they totally miss it. Just like you and I do all the time. But it's in the familiar. It's in the calling of Mary's name. It's in the holding of that net as it gets so full of fish it's about to break. It's in the time of breaking bread and the prayer of your rabbi. It's it's in the familiar, like sitting on a concrete tower down by a river, where suddenly we recognize who Jesus is. And the familiar that they get it, that they understand. This morning, I want to do something familiar. I want to lead us in a time of communion. I want it to be different than what we normally do for communion. I'm not going to invite the worship team up because I want the worship team to have a chance to take it with us. It's just us. It's those of us online. It's those of us in this room. It's us and it's God I want to have a time of remembrance of the work that was done to break our chains, remember the gift of life and life eternal. And I want to do it a little differently. So once we take the bread, I'm going to invite you into the call and response. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And once we take the cup, again, I will invite you into the response. He is risen. He is risen indeed. For, and in no way are we disrespecting the work done on the cross as we do this. If anything, we are remembering the whole picture of the work that has been done for us. Because communion, while it is often somber and while it is often a time of remembrance, is also a time of celebration. Communion is the greatest celebration of the Christian faith because that cross is empty because that tomb is empty. And today as we sit in this room and we look at these crosses and we see the white draping across of them, that is to remind us that the work is done. It's done. There's nothing that you have to do. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to wear your Sunday best. You don't have to never make a mistake again. You don't have to know certain answers or certain questions. It's done. It's done. The work has been done for you. All that's left for you to do now is to say, you know what? Jesus, you you are so good. And I don't maybe understand everything I have to understand, but what I do know is I want to follow you. I want that in my life. I want to rejoice and say he is risen. Thanks. (laughs) 
didn't actually mean for that to be the calm response. But you know, you know what, it works, right? So I want you to be prepared that after we take the cup and take the bread, I'll invite you into that. You don't need to be a member of our church to take communion. We only ask that you want to follow Jesus. That's it. And you know what? Maybe you've never made that decision before, and that's okay. Maybe this can be that decision for you today. There's no pressure. We do think, though, that if you have conflict with a brother or sister in Christ, you should take care of that before you have communion. And so I invite you into taking care of that before you partake of communion. I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians 11 for the communion passage. And if you want, there are two tops to this. The first top gives you access to the bread. And the second top will open the cup for you. 1 Corinthians 11. For I have received of the Lord that which I have also delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father in heaven, on this Easter, we do remember the work of the cross. And we celebrate it. We mourn all that your son had to go through, all that he had to endure. And we are thankful for the gift of life and life eternal that is professed every single time we see a cross. Every time we see a cross, we are reminded what it means and we are reminded that it is empty. We are reminded that your son's body was broken for us, but it did not stay broken because you have promised eternal life and you have delivered eternal life. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to guide us as we seek to follow you, even if it means that our body is sometimes broken. God, we want to say, Jesus, I love you so much I die for you. And we want to mean it. We want to be there. Thank you, God, for the work you've done. In your name, amen. amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. After the same manner, he also took the cup, saying, this cup is the new testament in my blood and this you do in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you show the Lord's death until he comes our father in heaven we do thank you for again again the work of the cross we thank you that you who knew no sin knew sin for us. God, I want to thank you that I don't have to have it all together, have it all figured out, or even be perfect to know that that gift is a gift that you've given to me this morning. I don't want to forget. I don't want to take advantage of what's been done. I don't want to take it for granted, Lord. I want to remember right now as I take this cup what you've given to me. And with all of my heart, God, I say thank you. In your name, amen. amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you for this day and thank you for this group of people. Those who are online, those who are with us in person today, we are so blessed to have a community of people who are willing to gather together and who are willing to worship you, to lift up our voices together, whether that be in song, whether that be reading scripture, whether that be in fellowship over a cup of coffee in the lobby. In whatever way it is, God, we are so blessed to have this community. So we thank you for it, and we ask your blessing to be upon it. God, let none of us walk away from this place or this room not knowing the gift that has been given to us this morning. We celebrate that gift. We celebrate the empty cross. 
Not, not a single one of us that chooses to follow Jesus is there a black stain that can stick to us. We are now as white as snow and white as the draping that hangs on the cross because of the work of the Son. Let us not forget and let us not take for granted. Father God, we love you. You are so good. We give you this final song together with all of our hearts, all of our breath, with all the beats in our heart. In your name, amen. Hi, this is Pastor Nick. Thanks for listening. I hope something that you heard today was very helpful. If you want to connect with us further, feel free to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or our website, kanoichurch.org. Sure, I'm glad we're in this together.